Sabrina the Animated Series, Episode 43. Chloe asks Sabrina if she's ready for the first day of school, and she smiles, replying to her. So that's a nice moment if you stretch it, and they find out there's a school fair to check out. I don't remember that. The story's boring after this. Why would I want to see an extended amount of focus on something mundane? Chloe calls Gem a hypocrite when she calls Sabrina empty-headed. Quigley says it's impressive that Sabrina's researching history, and it's because she signed up for the History Club. It only makes sense if you think about it, because she's got ants who've lived for hundreds of years. Except that doesn't cause most people to research their grandparents' time. Zelda complains about royalty. Sabrina signed up for girls' water polo, too. And Hilda asks a question so she gets turned into a sea dragon for a joke. Wasn't Quigley bitching about actual magic abuse? He hopes Sabrina isn't overloading herself. Well, I guess being too scared to bitch at them for magic abuse. He says there's no time in her schedule set aside to sleep, and she just casually says she can make that up on the weekend. There's no way she wouldn't have any time set aside to sleep, because the school clubs wouldn't take place during the night. She'd instantly learn the moral here. The show thinks every preteen is impossibly stupid. How'd she even be allowed to sign up for too many clubs at once? It turns out she signed up to learn how to play the tuba because it was the only instrument left. He tells her it's not how much you do, it's how well you do it. And she asks if he's been learning from Chloe, when usually she's not about spouting adult-level wisdom. And Salem gets turned into a clam for wanting to eat Hilda. Sabrina gets greeted from outside her bedroom window by someone who wants her to go to rock climbing club. Somehow. And the show wastes my time when Salem tells her she's stretching herself too thin, and again she's an airhead by not instantly believing him. Why would they think this is a good protagonist? I can barely stand her. It's better to show off the lesson by having her act exhausted. At least every time I get bored, the show cuts to showing her try out a different thing. She jogs and looks at her watch and runs into a yoga class with a tuba. Somehow she got her schedule mixed up. She uses magic on her face, and I keep wondering why she has a band-aid instead of her having healed herself. Why does Salem tell her she should be twins? He should have known that tempted her to use the traitor jar. Why does she come to the idea to trust Spooky on her own? The Sabrina I know would summon clones herself. Why does she have to wait until she wakes up in the morning for the clones to greet her in her bed? And it shows how little she trusts Zelda that she magically puts a chair against her doorknob when she knocks on the door and doesn't want her to see them. She says she heard voices. Why didn't she instantly warp into Sabrina's room and prevent the whole plot? Or warp Sabrina to her? She wants Sabrina to spend time with the family because she doesn't see her anymore. How sweet. She would have seen her every time she went home from school. And somehow, when Quigley sees Sabrina too much, he assumes it's from Sunstroke, even though he knows she's a witch. So again, he would have ended the episode right there. I assume the red-shirted Sabrina is the real Sabrina. Why did Sabrina sign up for rock climbing if she's scared of heights? Well, she could say she wants to get rid of her fear without brainwashing. A clone ends up catching and juggling, and hands people back the things they dropped. Jem complains that Spellman beats her at cross-country, and she's suspicious. The clones hope there's enough spaghetti for seconds and thirds. Sabrina's so desperate to conserve magic, she won't just zap up more. One of the clones asks why she gets to decide what they do, when it should be obvious. So she must just be asking a rhetorical question. It makes sense that they didn't say that right away, because they probably assumed the clubs would be fun before they actually got to experience them. She gets jealous of seeing Harvey get hugged by a clone, and Sabrina complains about her clones disobeying her. She was spiteful of her to hug Harvey instead of just sapping up a fake Harvey to hug. Jem sees Sabrina and the clones. I get her not wanting Zelda to find out she screwed up, so that's why she doesn't warp her two words to get her memory erased. I get Jem not figuring out magic exists and she assumes she's always been triplets. But no, she totally bought that it was all mirrors when you can see mirrors, and there's no reason mirrors would be here. Why doesn't Sabrina just point to instantly get rid of the clones? Well, she'd be attached to them. 
Why doesn't she brainwash them into obedience? She brainwashed Quigley to dance with his date. So that was brainwashing him into obedience because he was doing what she wanted. Jem figured out that there's multiple Sabrinas, and we see Sabrina struggle to cook and say a spell about an awesome flambe. There's no way it results in the chocolate splashing everyone, because she'd have to imagine that. She said awesome. Then the story gets dull until finally Jem sees all the Sabrinas again. Sabrina says a spell to make her forget she ever saw them. But she still says it's over, rather than making fun of her for saying a spell. Because split apart, they have no powers, apparently. If Sabrina can even think that she can erase someone's memory of magic herself, she shouldn't have taken until now. And now I'm going to wonder why she doesn't do this every time a mortal witnesses magic. Now I'm wondering why she doesn't use magic all the time. Jem doesn't have to put her hand on Sabrina's shoulder. Why can she motivate herself to do an affectionate gesture like that if she doesn't like her, and she doesn't bring herself to say she wants to be her friend because she's so lonely, and she's just a distant? Why does the story torture us with her mediocre singing? Jem grabs her saying she sang her last note. Why would she talk like she's planning to kill her if she showed earlier that she wouldn't? Sabrina gets a net put over. I hate how it's impossible to tell who the clones are. The audience should get a better indicator of that that wouldn't make you wonder why the normal people don't catch on immediately. Different clothes aren't good enough because the original Sabrina still has a different outfit from the one Sabrina usually wears. Jem somehow convinced authority figures to follow her to the room. The Sabrinas decide to hold hands and use magic and warp away, and only Sabrina is here. Somehow the adults laugh at her. It's still sad because I feel like there are still people. So they gave up their lives, and somehow Sabrina's just happy about this. How did no one point out that usually Sabrina wears the same outfit every day? I guess in between episodes, she does wear a different outfit every day. And we're finally getting to see these different outfits she usually wears. This story is the cliche clones cartoon plot. And it fails on Sabrina because she trusted Spooky for no reason to do something she can do. So I assume he purposefully made it so that the clones would eventually stop following her orders to go do what they want, how dare they. More likely his only curse was that they'd only have powers when they all use their magic at once. I assume the reason Sabrina doesn't instantly undo the spell is that she got emotionally attached to them because she engaged herself in conversation with them like they were her friends. It was a constantly interesting episode though because it always kept switching up the clubs it showed us. So even though it demonized magic, can I really say I didn't enjoy it? It's like all you've got to do is be creative. For example, Panthers' stories have plenty of idiot balls too. Most of the time they're doing new things for the Sonic franchise, so all I usually remember them for is the new idea. And that applies to every writer. The plot's about how you shouldn't sign up for too many school clubs or you'll exhaust yourself. A worthlessly Captain Obvious s -up. But that was properly told in the first scene where she was lectured about it. The story doesn't make any sort of effort to explain what's too much. It doesn't explain what exact amount of clubs you shouldn't sign up for, which would actually be helpful in getting you to follow the lesson of the episode properly. A lot of people are still going to make Sabrina's mistake because they have no way of knowing what's too much. Sabrina the Animated Series Episode 44 the story wastes my time showing a fictional movie in the theaters for way too long. The shouts sound silly. Sabrina says out loud that she has a use for Hilda's anti-popcorn hoarding spell. At least she and her friends got to enjoy a movie. Sabrina unnecessarily jokes about the protagonist of the movie when that just annoys the boys and she stands there doing nothing when the bully grabs Harvey and throws him. I get her thinking that there was no way she could defend him without revealing magic though. It would be a hassle to erase memories, which she can do. Harvey says the bully would have been beaten by Devin DeGaulle. Harvey keeps revealing he's going to be too busy with his Devin obsession to hang out with her. Sabrina complains to Salem and he says she has a whiny voice. She uses magic on cookies to send them into the living room and sees the reporter. Why is she trusting Spooky again? And his scene takes too long because he inexplicably does a haiku, so he's told that it didn't rhyme, and then he mocks Sabrina. 
Sabrina uses magic herself to brainwash the director into saying he'll do filming in Riverdale. I mean, Greendale. So I have to assume that she's using Spooky's borrowed magic. Hilda somehow says she might be given a part, even though she's not an actress. Salem insults Quigley. Sabrina brainwashed Quigley herself without needing to go to Spooky. Harvey convinced himself that if he shows up dressed as a ninja, he'll get Tevin to hire him as his sidekick. But somehow, tons of others had that idea. So he decides to sneak onto the set. And Sabrina goes after him. Somehow, the guard only noticed Sabrina. And it turns out the moving camera has shapeshifted Sabrina. Instead of her brainwashing him into changing his mind, he meets him anyways. But he's in a disguise to sneak off the set for a few minutes. He must have carried that disguise with him ahead of time. After leaving his vehicle. And he conveniently decides to go out for coffee with some preteens he just met. It'd make more sense if Sabrina brainwashed him since she was fine with doing that to the director. These are just any random fans to him. Devin's overworked, and his voice is annoying. It's too whispery to sound like that of a real action hero. Devin must be a real monster to make a preteen pay for all of the arcade games for him, even though a movie star would be rich. At least he gives him his gold watch and says to see what he can get for this. So he's not above sacrificing something he has. So why doesn't he just pay for it directly? Devin reveals to Harvey that some of the things he thought he knew about him were lies, so his whispery voice was foreshadowing. Why is Devin spending so much time with these preteens he just met? I just have to assume this is a part of her spell from earlier. Eventually, Harvey gets disappointed at finding out that Devin gets replaced by a stuntman when it comes to doing the really dangerous things. Harvey thought he did his own stunts because of his training cards. So why is Devin smiling and assuming that he loved his acting job anyways? Hilda wants to flatter Devin, even though she'd have seen that the stuntman rescued the CIA agent, not him. She invites him to dinner at her place. Harvey's seen at Sabrina's house disappointed, and Salem gets abused for talking annoyingly for no reason. Quickly flatters Devin on his cooking skills. Then Devin gets scared of a spider. You know, the story didn't need to spend so much time showing how lame Devin is. Not to mention, it's a little sexist to portray someone as amazing at cooking while also portraying them as not manly enough for Harvey. It's really satisfying to see Harvey call him out that he's nothing but a big fraud. Sabrina tells him that he's not a jerk, just a guy trying to do his job, even though obviously he is a jerk because he had no reason to lie. People would have admired him anyways. Harvey says that Quigley didn't portray himself as a hero on TV. Sabrina would have known that. She has the ridiculous logic that an actor can't portray an action hero if he isn't one deep down. Does she not realize how many actors there are? Harvey's somehow sitting in a bell tower that's going to be blown up by a director. I assume he's here because it's associated with Devin, but if he's disillusioned with Devin, there's no reason he'd be in anything associated with his movies then. Not to mention there's so many other places he could have been associated with Devin. Unless this is his only movie set in town. It's like the show is forcing it to happen to spite Sabrina for her magic at every turn. Sabrina's magic summons a mirror showing her where Harvey is so that she can instantly warp to just outside of his window and fall. Why won't she die from that? Well, she does summon a big baseball glove to catch her. But there's no way she wouldn't have warped to right beside him, like she did earlier. At no point has she ever warped to the wrong place by accident. She did something as competent as little Sabrina and they immediately felt like they had to make up for it. Sabrina tells Devin the truth, which predictably inspires him to try to save him instead of simply getting the stuntman to do it, because he feels like he has something to prove. He even overcomes his fear of spiders. Harvey jumps away from fire and grabs a rope. Why should I be supportive of the plot forcing him to respect Devin all over again? It didn't need to write a scene where he had to save his life. It would be cool if Sabrina saved his life. He was supposed to learn not to put someone on a pedestal. Instead, he learns that he can be a hero. What's this supposed to tell us? That you're right to put someone on a pedestal because in rare situations, they could impress you? They never take advantage of the opportunity when they do repeat a message to show that it doesn't always apply. Harvey reminds Devin that he promised to give him a cooking lesson this weekend. 
It's instantly predictable that when the bully says he's got one thing to say, he does something nice instead. He asks for an autograph. Which makes sense, he is a celebrity. So why did he have an antagonistic tone before? It's a bad idea to portray an overweight friendless kid as the bully all the time. Because in real life, bullies roam in packs. And overweight friendless kids are pretty likely to be bullied themselves. This episode is about Harvey finding out his favorite actor doesn't do his own stunts because Sabrina brainwashed the director with Spooky's borrowed magic into filming in Riverdale. I mean, Greendale. It's got someone other than Sabrina learning the lesson for once, which immediately makes me wonder why the whole show can't have Harvey be the one learning the lessons. Because he's supposed to be stupider than Sabrina. And he learned that she was a witch in the sitcom, so why wasn't she written to know that from the start in this show? It's a miracle Chloe even exists. Sabrina didn't like the result of that spell because she felt bad for Harvey for being disappointed. But it did work because it cured its obsession with the actor and it's really a minor, temporary problem. It was totally forced that he ended up in a tower that went up in flames. I think Spooky wanted that to happen. It's way too over the top. The writer just wanted a climax that spits in the face of his message that if you put someone on a pedestal, they're gonna fall off. Apparently, he is capable of being an action hero, just like he thought. Even though most action hero actors aren't. This wasn't necessary. It's a bad episode because most of the time it's boring with too much focus on the lame mortal. But it's just barely bad because there's a lot of worse episodes. It should have been explained at the end that the ants have seen plenty of people who they put on a pedestal just for them to turn out not to be how they wanted them to be. So it's still giving the message that most of the time if you idolize someone you're going to be disappointed by them. Some people who are worth idolizing really are all they're cracked up to be. Some people who are worth idolizing while not literally all they're cracked up to be can still be awesome enough that they deserve to be admired. I'm thinking of Dolly Parton right now because she's really charitable. But I think the message that usually someone put on a pedestal is going to disappoint you is a much more valuable message for impressionable kids because that's more likely to be the case.